Please turn with me to the book of Galatians in the New Testament, one of Paul's epistles. I want to pick up in Galatians chapter 2 this morning. We continue in this warlike epistle in which the Apostle Paul is engaged in a battle for the souls of these Galatian Christians. And if you've been with us, you know that the Galatians are toying with a false gospel. They are in the process of turning away from God to a counterfeit message that promised them salvation by faith in Christ plus works. And Paul is writing this epistle in his own hand with large letters, he says in chapter 6, to tell them very earnestly, do not be deceived. Do not be taken in by the slavery of works righteousness. Don't return to the law, but stick with the freedom of the true gospel, the one that Christ delivered, the message of free salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And to persuade them to listen to him, he must do a bit of self-justification and to clear his name and defend the authenticity of his apostleship and thus his gospel. Let's read this morning. Our text will be Galatians chapter 2, 1 through 10. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter... For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and let us briefly pray one final time as we come to the preaching of his word. If you would bow with me. Our gracious God and Father, we again come before you and plead with you that you would glorify your name among us this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would write your word upon our hearts, that, Lord, we would attend to your word with carefulness, that we would seek to understand the things that are written for our own encouragement and for our preservation of the gospel and our being helpful and loving to those around us who need the truth of the gospel. Father, we pray that you would teach us the importance of this letter Lord, that you would teach us to understand why the Apostle Paul is so very serious when it comes to the error of these false teachers, the error of adding to Christ, the error of teaching that we need Christ and yet we need something a bit more, teaching that we need not only trust Him for righteousness, but we also need to offer you our own works of righteousness and obedience. Lord, we pray you would teach us why and how that false gospel destroys and undermines the reality of grace. Lord, we come before you recognizing by your grace that we are sinners, that we have nothing to offer you, nothing in our hands do we bring. 
we in our sinful state are unable to do anything to commend ourselves to you, and it is only by your grace given in Christ Jesus that we are accepted in him. Lord, teach us to love Christ. Teach us to be thankful for your mercies to us in your Son. Teach us now to praise you, even as we will forever in eternity. Offer praises to your name for your glorious grace and kindness towards your people. Father, draw near to to us, we pray. We ask, Lord, for any who are here who are unbelieving, perhaps those who are here who are presently trusting in their own supposed righteousness, who think that certainly they are of a caliber and of a good enough nature to be accepted by the Holy One of Israel. Lord, we pray that you would humble them by your word and by your spirit. Teach them their sinfulness. Bring them low. Make them feel their helplessness and cause the cross of Christ to be glorious to them. Cause them to depart from any hope of righteousness in themselves and to come and to cling solely to the cross of Christ. Father, glorify yourself, we pray. We ask that you would help us and draw near to us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Paul's gospel is under siege. Paul's teachers called Judaizers have gotten in the ear of these young Christians and are feeding them poison. And their poison takes the form of a so-called gospel that mixes Christ with human merit. It mingles grace with law, mingles faith with works. To be saved, Galatians, they were telling them, you need to believe in Christ, that's true enough, but you also need to do something more. You need to perform the works of the law. You need to become Jews. You need to become circumcised, and then you can become a part of the people of God. It was a false gospel that is still alive and well in our own day, the, gospel, the false gospel of Christ plus something. And this flew, of course, in the face of Paul's gospel that he brought to them when he established the church at Galatia, and many of them were converted under his ministry. When he came preaching, Galatians, you need Christ, period. Christ is a sufficient redeemer. He can save you completely to the uttermost, not just partially. It is the Christ's finished work that you must trust in. There is not a jot or a tittle you can add by way of your own obedience. Christ is the way of peace with God. And in order to make their poison easier to swallow, the Judaizers poisoned the well of Paul's character, saying that what Paul brought to them was man's gospel, not God's gospel. Remember, we considered that last time. They were telling the Galatians that Paul has no real authority. He's not recognized by the influential apostles in Jerusalem who actually walked with the Lord Jesus, but rather Paul is just a vigilante preacher. He is a second-class apostle who stole the gospel from Jerusalem and then proceeded to twist it for his own benefit. Of course, there is no historical evidence for these accusations. In fact, quite the contrary, Paul knows that it is actually the Judaizers who are manipulating history and twisting what the Jerusalem apostles believe. And that's the reason that we have this big, long, autobiographical section that spans all the way from chapter 1 through chapter 2. And I mentioned before, this is not just fun history that Paul thought might keep his readers a bit more engaged. This is Paul's legal defense. This is Paul's alibi, proving the thesis that he laid down in chapter 1, verse 11, very important verse, proving that his gospel was not received from man nor through man but by revelation of Jesus Christ himself. If Paul is going to win these Galatians back, he must answer the accusations that have been raised against him, and he must establish the divine origin of his authority as an apostle. And you remember from last time, he recounted the extraordinary manner of his conversion. You remember how he emphasized that it was not the Jerusalem apostles, it was not a human preacher, it was not a seminary, who taught Paul the gospel, but Jesus Christ himself from heaven on the Damascus road confronted him and imparted to him by revelation that gospel that he preached now to the Gentiles 
And Christ himself turned Paul onto the apostolic ministry. And more than that, he recounted how not only was his conversion apart from human instrumentality, he reminds the Galatians how for years after his conversion, he continued to preach that gospel in isolation and independently from the Jerusalem apostles. He said in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood because he didn't need to. He had seen the risen Christ himself. He didn't need Jerusalem's validation. He had been commissioned by the Lord from heaven. Well, now in chapter 2, he's progressing that argument. And it's related, but it's different. While chapter 1 emphasizes that his authority and thus his gospel are not dependent on Jerusalem's validation, now in chapter 2 he's saying, but that does not mean that Jerusalem disagrees with me. Indeed, Galatians, if you want to know whose side Jerusalem is on in this whole battle, they stand squarely with me and not the Judaizers, and I can prove it to you. Well, how, Paul? How can you prove it? by a real face-to-face, in-the-flesh meeting Paul had with these apostles. It's amazing when you reflect on the providence of God in Paul's life. Such was the providence of God that Paul spent enough years apart from the Jerusalem apostles to prove the independence of his apostolic commission and ministry. And yet, as well in God's providence, when the time was right, he established his unity and his agreement with Jerusalem to show that they were of one mind. The Judaizers thought that they could so venerate the Jerusalem apostles. That's what they they sought to do. They sought to lift up the Jerusalem apostles so as to belittle Paul and discredit Paul. But Paul here has up his sleeve real verifiable proof that it is not Paul who's out of step with Jerusalem, but the Judaizers. And when we, uh, in terms of dividing up our passage, we can divide it into three sections this morning, and then we'll have a few words of application at the end. Three sections. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, we have the setting or the purpose for the meeting. Verses 1 and 2, the setting or the purpose for the meeting. In verses 3 through 6, we have the controversy of the meeting. And then in verses 7 through 10, we have the outcome of the meeting. So, let's consider, first of all, the setting or the purpose of this meeting in verses 1 and 2. Paul says in verse 1, He says, then, and just an encouragement when you read your Bible, remember that the chapter breaks were not inspired. When Paul wrote the epistle to the Galatians, he wrote chapter 2, verse 1, right on the heels of the last verse of chapter 1. He is continuing now to chronicle his personal history and in particular, his involvement with the Jerusalem apostles. He says, then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas. And most likely, he's counting 14 years from the time of his conversion on the Damascus Road, though there there are some who think that he could be counting 14 years from his previous visit with Peter, mentioned in verse 18 of chapter 1. But either way, it's a very long period of time that has elapsed in which he has continued to preach his gospel among the Gentiles without any consultation with the other apostles, proving his independence from them. But now after 14 years, verse 2 says he went up with Barnabas to Jerusalem. And notice he didn't go up simply on his own accord, but he says, I went up because of a revelation. In other words, God is the one who directed Paul to Jerusalem. And we see God directing his apostles in the early church in these extraordinary ways. It doesn't mean that we should today expect identical experiences. It simply means that there were unique things God was doing in the early church especially with the apostles in these formative years. Uh, For instance, in Acts, you're familiar, if you've read Acts, you're familiar with Peter's vision uh, to go and see Cornelius. Uh, You're familiar with Paul's vision in Acts 16 to go to Macedonia. And also another way the Lord directed His apostles, in addition to visions, is He directed them through the New Testament prophets and actual prophecies being given by the prophets of the New Testament. And that seems to be what happened here Um, And there's more that we could get into that I simply don't have time to get into. We can talk about it privately in terms of the dating of Galatians and the audience of Galatians and things like that. But suffice it to say, I'm not convinced, as some think, uh, and good men think this, I'm not convinced that this meeting that Paul is describing here in in Galatians 2 
is the same meeting that's described in Acts 15. You're probably familiar with the famous meeting of Acts 15 known as the Jerusalem Council. And there's many reasons I could give you. I'll just give you a couple here. Um, one of the reasons I don't think we should equate this meeting with Acts 15 is because Acts 15 seems to be a very public debate, a public discussion, whereas Paul says here in Galatians 2 verse 2 that this was a private meeting in which he lays out his gospel between him and the Jerusalem apostles, whom he calls pillars. Um, another reason is in Acts 15, there's no mention of a revelation that urges Paul to go to Jerusalem, but rather it's actually the churches who encourage and urge Paul to go to Jerusalem. And so I think it's more plausible that this meeting is the one rather described in Acts 11, verses 27 through 30. And you can turn there if you're quick. Uh, you can, I encourage you to read it later on your own time. In Acts 11, 27 through 30, there is a New Testament prophet named Agabus. And Agabus stands up, Luke says, and he showed by the Spirit, that is revelation, he, he is prophesying, he showed by the Spirit that a great famine was going to come upon all the land, and the disciples all determined to send relief from the famine, or for the famine to the churches in Judea, which obviously would include Jerusalem, and they send it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, that seems to coincide very nicely with what Paul says here, that it was a revelation given through the prophet that relief needs to be sent to Jerusalem because of the famine. And that also jives well, I think, if you notice verse 10, the closing verse of our section, what do the Jerusalem apostles encourage Paul to do as they part ways? He, they encourage him to remember the poor. Right? That encouragement seems to make sense in light of a famine that was going on. And so, Paul and Barnabas make their way to Jerusalem one reason is to bring relief to those in Judea from the famine, but the Lord has another purpose for this visit, namely to guard and protect the truth of the gospel through this meeting that would take place. And while I can't be dogmatic, I do think it's very possible that the Lord also revealed this purpose to Paul and revealed to Paul that there's going to be controversy in Jerusalem, not controversy with the Jeru Jerusalem apostles, but with the false brothers who will sneak in and that might explain why Paul brought along with Barnabas, he brought along another very important character named Titus. Titus is a major player in this meeting, and the reason for that might have been more plain to the original recipients of this letter than it is to us. Titus is not exactly the name of a good thoroughbred Jew, is it? Uh, you can't get more Greek than a guy named Titus. Uh, he, he is thoroughbred Greek. Uh, just as Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he's not just half Greek like Timothy was. Um, he is, he's pure blood, if you will. Uh, he's, he's as uncircumcised as they come. He's never kept this Jewish ceremonial law. He's now a Christian who's being, been converted under Paul's ministry. Paul calls him a son in the faith. And Paul brings him along to this meeting with the Jerusalem apostles. And that's why I say I think it, it, it's quite possible that Paul also know, knew by revelation that there was going to be this controversy, and Titus is something of a test case. Uh, verse 2, they head up to Jerusalem, and they, he, Barnabas, and Titus, and verse 2, Paul says, they communicated to them, or set before them, that is, they set before the Jerusalem apostles, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation. Now, we've got to understand something about this passage. Paul is using some irony here. You probably noticed it almost gets redundant uh, in the passage. Four times in the passage, Paul refers to this Jerusalem company. Uh, specifically, James, Peter, and John are mentioned in verse 9. He, he refers to this Jerusalem company in, in almost over-the-top venerating language. If you notice in verse 2, he calls them those of reputation or influence. Uh, verse 6, twice they are called, those who are something or influential. And then in verse 9, finally, he calls them those who seem to be pillars. And what Paul is doing here is he's playing the Judaizers' own game. I've, I've already alluded to this. The Judaizers' tactic had been to so venerate uh, the Jerusalem apostles, not sincerely, but simply because they wanted to discredit Paul as a nobody, they wanted to create this fra uh, uh, faction between Jerusalem and Paul, 
And they so exalted the Jerusalem and put so much weight on the Jerusalem apostles that Paul is ironically taking up their own language here and saying, okay, Judaizers, these men that you esteem so highly, that you claim are so much greater and more important than myself, I laid out my gospel to these influential men. I told them what I preach. And Paul's not here criticizing the apostles themselves. He's criticizing how the Judaizers have venerated them at the expense of Paul. He says, I laid out or set before my gospel, uh, my gospel before them. And then he says, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Now that at first glance probably seems very perplexing. Because you might read that and think that what Paul is saying here is that the reason he went to Jerusalem and laid out his gospel to them is because he really did have doubts and reservations about his gospel, and he wanted to make sure that his ministry hadn't been in vain, right? Kind of like, uh, almost like Paul's a nervous uh, student who kind of double-checks his answers by glancing over at his, his friend's paper just to make sure that he's not on the wrong track here. But we need to reject that interpretation outright because that is so contrary to everything Paul's been saying. You remember the opening of, of the epistle. He has said, even if an angel from heaven comes preaching a different gospel than the one I preached, let him be accursed. Right? Those are not the words of a man who is uncertain. When he says, rather here, when he says, lest I might run or had run in vain, he's speaking from a pragmatic perspective. And let me explain it this way. Even though Paul knew that his gospel was the gospel of Christ, he knew that it was, uh, it's heaven's truth. From a practical perspective, he knew that if he did not establish his solidarity with the Jerusalem apostles, and if someone like the Judaizers managed to drive a wedge between Jerusalem and Paul, he knew that would prove detrimental to his apostolic endeavors. I mean, just, just imagine it. If Jerusalem got persuaded by a dishonest group to issue an edict that Paul's gospel is different from ours, I imagine what an impediment that would be for all of Paul's ministry. Uh, everywhere he had preached the gospel, everywhere he would preach the gospel, it would be now as if he has this warrant out that follows him from Jerusalem that says, don't listen to Paul. And so that's what's going on here. Paul recognizes the importance of establishing his solidarity with the Jerusalem apostles so that he would not make his labor in vain. Now, that's where things get excited, uh, exciting, the meeting itself. Uh, in verses 3 through 6, let's turn to our second point here, the controversy. The controversy in verses 3 through 6. You know, the church has had some very, very exciting meetings in its history, uh, but I really look forward in heaven to learning more about the details of how this took place, to hear about how these false brethren snuck in, to hear about the, the courage of Paul. Uh, if you look at verses 3 through 6, let's get the, the scene in our minds. In this room, you've got three groups. Two of them were invited to be there, and one invited themselves as unwelcome guests. You've got one group, Paul, Titus, and Barnabas, and they are uh, setting before them the gospel that they preach uh, to the Gentiles. And then you've got the pillars of Jerusalem, which specifically Peter, uh, James, and John are mentioned, and probably there were more, I would think, uh, representing Jerusalem, but they're the main ones. And then you've got this third group in verse 4 that Paul calls pseudodelphoi, false brothers. And it's not a coincidence that these false brothers in Jerusalem have the same theology as the Judaizers in Galatia. And Paul is not being subtle when he calls them false brothers. Paul gives us, right, right at the beginning, right up front, the outcome of this meeting in verse 3. It's almost as if he just wants to make the point clear that if you get nothing else, you need to understand how the meeting concluded. And then he goes on to describe the, the skirmish that took place. If you look at verse 3, he says... And you can hear the, the emphaticness of his language, yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, right? That's the, that's the nail in the coffin regarding the Judaizers' claim that Jerusalem agreed with their false gospel. Uh, and the living proof is Titus. Titus walked into that room uncircumcised, 
to discuss the gospel with the Jerusalem apostles, and he walked out of that room still uncircumcised. And it's interesting to note here that this is the first time the word circumcision appears in the letter. It's obviously been assumed thus far. It will certainly be unpacked more later on. But Christian, I want to pause here just for a moment and stress that you need to understand that this issue that the early church, the apostles were dealing with regarding the question of was circumcision, cir- circumcision necessary or not to be saved, this isn't just an isolated or an irrelevant issue. Uh, resist the temptation to think to yourself, well, we don't have any arguments about whether circumcision is required to be a part of the people of God, and so I guess, therefore, there must not be much application for us here. No, this question goes right to the heart of the gospel And this attack that the Judaizers are bringing rears its ugly head in every single age because it has to do with how a person can be righteous before God. When we read of Paul arguing against the necessity of circumcision, circumcision in Paul's context is but one example that stands for any form of human obedience that needs to be added to Christ in order for us to have peace with God. We could put it this way, and perhaps it would bring it closer to home. Is there anything more than believing in Christ that has to be performed by the sinner in order to be accepted by God? If you say yes to that question, you are on the side of the false brothers and the Judaizers. If you say yes, there is something more than trusting in Christ in order to be made right with God. You have perverted grace. You have turned the gospel no longer into good news, you have turned it into law, and you have traded grace for justice. This is what the Reformation was about in the 1500s. No one in the Reformation, you can read the Reformers, read all of them, no one in the Reformation denied the necessity of good works. We we believe that the Christian, the genuinely converted Christian, will live a life of godliness, a, a life of uprightness, giving himself to good deeds. But the role that good works plays is where the rub is. It's one thing to say that we obey God because we have been accepted freely by God because of the grace of God in Christ. That's orthodox. We must say that. But it is, according to Paul, another gospel if you reverse that and you say the sinner must obey God in order to be accepted by God. Because in doing so, you've destroyed the meaning of grace. And you have demoted Christ to a partial Savior. You have made Christ's work necessary. Sure, we need it, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough. When we mix sinful human works, doesn't matter what it might be, sinful human performances, when we mix those into the gospel, we make Christ but a partial Savior. And as Paul says, we make His death and His work of no effect. And Paul knew that. Paul saw right through this issue. He saw the implications. But here's the thing, the natural man doesn't like that, the unconverted man. Uh, Grace is an offense to the unconverted man's pride. The unconverted man wants to be able to contribute something to God. That way he might reserve at least something for himself to boast in. He wants to, uh, he would rather work for God as a slave rather than be received by God as a son And one other thing is that not only do they get offended by grace, they want to enslave others. And that is what these false brothers did at this meeting. If you look at verse 4, Paul says, this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty or our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, again, as I say, there are many questions I have. I look forward in heaven to learning more of what transpired here. But it seems at some point in this meeting, after Paul laid out his gospel, no doubt he's, he's using his uh, in-the-flesh prop of uh, Titus and talking about the gospel, that circumcision is not necessary to be saved. At some point, these false brothers object. They can't hold their silence any longer. And Paul, at this point in this passage, even the grammar of his Greek starts breaking rules. As it's as though he's just so filled with disgust with these men. He just starts uh, laying down and describing in very, very 
uh, not complementary terms the way that these men behave themselves. Uh, notice his words, his descriptions here are not words spoken about merely mistaken brothers. He's not talking about brothers who need some direction. These are men who were devious in their intentions to undermine the gospel and thwart the work of Christ. Notice he says they are false brothers. Brothers and sisters, that is a category we must have as Christians. Uh, just because someone calls themselves a Christian does, and names the name of brother does not mean that they are one. Uh, we, we learn the lesson, uh, we must learn the lesson of Paul here and identify true Christians not on the basis of sentimentality and fuzzy feelings and are they nice, but on the basis of truth. For Paul, you cannot be of God and oppose the gospel of God. And we therefore must share that conviction. He says they were devious. Notice the language. They sneaked in and they slipped in among the brothers, right? These are false friends. Uh, like Jude says in Jude 4, uh, false teachers who crept in. These are men who uh, wormed their way into the congregation and into this meeting. Um, Paul says they came as spies, okay? That's very important. They are not here because they're just open-minded, right? And that's another crucial distinction we need to have, brothers and sisters. There is a big difference between a misguided, genuine believer who might say something that you, causes you to go, wait, 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 <laughs> it's not quite right. There's a big difference between that and devious wolves like these men who make it their intention to speak falsehood and heresy. These men are spies. They're not here to learn. They snuck in with an agenda. And Paul says they sneaked in uh, to spy out our liberty. Notice, not because they longed to be free, but they sneaked in because they longed to bring those who were free into bondage or into slavery. Paul was a threat to their agenda in this meeting, and they saw it, and they saw that this is a watershed moment, and if we do not interject now and speak up now, Paul's gospel might prevail. And so they come out, however that took place, against Paul, against his gospel, but apparently they didn't realize who they were dealing with. And Paul is one of my heroes, one of my great heroes. This is one of the reasons. It's very, it's very interesting when you read the book of Acts, when you read Paul's epistles, it's fascinating that you see that it seems Paul, out of all the apostles, seemed to grasp the implications of the gospel even more quickly than the other apostles. We'll, we'll even see next week that Paul has to correct Peter, another, go, another apostle, because he was walking out of step uh, with the gospel. And it seems that Paul here, who's kind of, if you will, the Lone Ranger apostle, so to speak, he's the one who's leading the defense against these false brothers. Uh, the Judaizers realize this is a watershed moment for us, and Paul was right there to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and realized as well, yes, this is a watershed moment. And so what does Paul do? Verse 5, to them we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. R.C. Sproul, another one of my heroes, when R.C. Sproul got up on that table, if you haven't heard this story or read this story, go home this afternoon and read of the faithfulness and the passion of R.C. Sproul when the gospel was on the line. When R.C. Sproul got up on that table at that meeting that was discussing our Roman Catholics and Protestants together for the gospel, and he got up on the table on all fours, and he pleaded with the men across the table from him, do not compromise the gospel. He was following in the footsteps of Paul. That's not over the top. That's recognizing the import of the moment. When the gospel hangs in the balance, timidity is a shameful disposition to have. I think there are far too many pastors who don't realize that. We need brave men. Pray for pastors to be like Paul. Pray for pastors to be courageous, to believe truth is worth dying for. Enough with men who play it safe and never stand on anything, never take a stand for any truth, any doctrine, any practice. Too many pastors are like sails that just blow in the wind of whichever way something is going, rather than being like rocks that withstand the currents of the ocean. 
I think there are large swaths of evangelical pastors today who, if it had been them in this room, standing in Paul's place, they would have stayed silent. And they would have been railroaded by the Judaizers, and the gospel would have been lost. But not Paul. Because Paul, as he said in chapter 1, verse 10, he does not fear men. He loves the gospel, and he loves people. Notice verse 5. He says, in order that the truth of the gospel might continue with who? With you. He's talking to the Galatians there. He's saying, my taking a stand in Jerusalem sometime before this, however long it was, was in order to preserve the gospel today that you, Galatians, might have the truth of the gospel. Paul saw that if, if he for one moment hesitated or entertained the Judaizers' desire to circumcise Titus, regardless of the reasoning, he knew it would forever give the Judaizers the ammunition of saying that Jerusalem says in order to be saved, you must be circumcised. And the gospel would not only be lost for Paul, but for others. Well, what did the Jerusalem apostles think about this quarrel, this fight? Look at verse 6. He says, but from those who seem to be something, and again, that's Paul picking up the Judaizers kind of venerating language, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something, they added nothing to me. That is, they agreed with Paul. They didn't take Paul aside and teach him the way of truth more accurately, the way Priscilla and Aquila had to take Apollos aside and teach him more. They, they had no corrections to make. They had no doctrines to add. They added nothing to Paul. In other words, Paul's gospel, as he both presented it to them and then defended it, how wonderful would it have been to see the apostle Paul going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Judaizers in this room. As he presented it to Jerusalem and as he defended the gospel in front of them, their response was that he's perfectly in line with us and our gospel. That brings us our last point in terms of our outline this morning, more briefly, uh, the outcome of the meeting in verses 7 through 10. Verses 7 through 10 are one, is one of those long uh, Pauline run-on sentences, and it's, uh, it's a bit challenging at times to follow if you don't take it slow and understand uh, what he's saying here. He says in verse 7, but on the contrary, right, that is, on, uh, that is contrary to the Jerusalem apostles adding anything to Paul or anything to his gospel, on the contrary, when they saw, notice not when they taught him, but when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, just as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, and again, just for clarity, of course, Paul's not saying there that there are two different gospels, one for Jews and one for Gentiles. He's simply rec recognizing Peter and Paul have distinct cultures in which they are going out and ministering, one to the Gentiles, one to the Jews. And then verse 8, he says, for he, that is a reference to God, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Verse 9, and when James Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, here's the main verb of this big four-verse sentence, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. In other words, what the Judaizers told the Galatians should have been, what they told the Galatians should have been a great scene of dissension with the Jerusalem apostles going at it with the apostle Paul. Paul says actually ended as a glorious scene of unity and fellowship. They gave to Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. That is, they embraced them. They recognized them as co-laborers in the cause of Christ, and each of them departed, each team departed, committed to going to discharge their ministry for the glory of God, Paul to the Gentiles, and the others to the Jews. Two different cultures, but one gospel. More than that, notice they recognized Paul's apostleship. Notice it does not say that they gave to him apostleship, but rather it says they gave to him the right hand of fellowship because, verse 7, they saw that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles. And verse 9, because they had perceived the grace that had been given Paul. 
It's amazing. When they talked with Paul, they didn't merely hear doctrinal accuracy. They did hear that. They heard orthodoxy. But they perceived the work of the grace of God in his heart. They perceived this is a man who, who knows Christ. He's seen Christ. He learned his gospel from Christ. He loves Christ, and he's been endowed by, with grace from Christ to be an apostle just like we have been. Paul is indeed one of us as they extend the right hand of fellowship to him, thus driving a nail through the Judaizers' claim that Paul was, act, was out of step with the other apostles. Well, that brings us to our application this morning as we bring our sermon to a close. Let's consider application and how this applies to us as Christians and non-Christians. First of all, I want to give you three. I want to give you three this morning. First of all, Christian, I want you to listen in very intently in this exhortation. Christian, you must know the gospel in its purity. You must know the gospel in its purity. New believers are new believers. We understand that. We understand that we, we don't expect our two-year-olds to, to grasp the same amount as our six-year-olds or our 13-year-olds, but perpetual immaturity is not the pattern for the New, Christ, New Testament Christian. Hebrews 6, verse 1, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. And I know very well that there are many people who claim to be Christians in our day, Many of them are active in churches, they do nursery, they teach in Sunday school, they, they do so much in terms of external activity around the church, and yet if you ask them what the gospel is, they could not tell you if their life depended on it. If you were to be in their presence and suddenly you were to utter the same heresy the Judaizers were saying, they would not recognize it. They wouldn't think anything of it. But brothers and sisters, it ought not be so among us. Brothers, we need discernment. We need to be grounded in doctrine, not sentiment. We, we need to be able to say, not just pastors, but every Christian, we need to be able to say when we hear something contrary to the truth, Paul says, not just say, well, that sounds nice. They seem like a lovely person. They seem like they were nice. Christian men, Christian women, Christian children, all of us, False brothers and counterfeit gospels abound, and yes, many of them, if not most of them, claim to be Christian. It's one of my great concerns of our day that too many professing Christians live off of what I call meme theology or postcard theology. It's one verse taken out of context, or they saw a meme once, and that's, that's, that's how they live in terms of being grounded in the Word of God. But brothers and sisters, uh, meme theology, postcard theology will not cut it. I'm delighted, just as delighted as you are, that we have access to all these good quotes that we can pick up, and they, they're useful in sermons at times from guys like MacArthur and J.I. Packer and all these men. But at the end of the day, we must know the gospel. It must be in us. It must be in you as a Christian. Uh, because heresy can often appear a lot closer to the truth than we realize when people think of false teachers in our day, a lot of times they just think of those who are just miles off the mark, those who are just, you know, obviously heretics. No one would listen to them. Uh, sadly, people do still listen to them. But if that were the case, Jesus wouldn't call, they wouldn't, he wouldn't have called them wolves in sheep's clothing. Sometimes all it takes, like in Galatians, is one what seems like a little tweak. Christ plus speaking in tongues saves you. Christ plus the act of obedience of being baptized in water saves you. Right? You might ask, what's the big deal? What, what's the big deal? Well, let me encourage you, if you don't recognize the big deal, then that's all the more reason for why you need this exhortation, because Paul wasn't overreacting. Paul didn't, didn't say just, what's the big deal? The, the issue at hand is not how small or big a thing you are adding to Christ, but the fact is that you're adding anything to Christ at all. The moment we add a single thing to Christ, we have dethroned Him as an all-sufficient Savior, and we have placed our trust in an object other than Christ alone. And that is why it is a big deal. It could be speaking in tongues, it could be baptism, it could be all sorts of things that people lift up as what you must do to be a Christian. And every single one of them, if it is not the empty hands of faith, 
If it is something that I contribute, every single one of them dethrones Christ and makes me, at least in part, my own Savior. Christian, it's good that you have pastors, and praise God if you have pastors who guard you. That's one of the reasons we're here. But any good pastor wants to see you stand on your own two feet, firm in the gospel, so that you are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Think about it. What if, God forbid, one day I started telling you another gospel? What then? You cannot just blindly follow me. You must follow the Word of God. Even as Paul says, even if I preach to you a different gospel than the one I preached to you, let him be accursed. Parents, especially fathers, are you teaching your kids the gospel? Not just, you know, the pithy things like Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Are you rooting your kids in the gospel? Or are you teaching them mere moralism? You'd be surprised at how often the doctrine of the Judaizers actually creeps into Christian parenting, right? Christian parenting gets turned into simply be a good boy or a good girl and everything will turn out well for you, right? That's, that's not the gospel. <laughs> that, that's actually encouraging our children to approach God on the basis of law rather than on the basis of grace. The gospel is about grace, about how we cannot come to God on the basis of our obedience, right? Are we teaching our children to relate to God on the basis of Christ's righteousness for me and the grace of God, or are we teaching them to relate to God on the basis of a covenant of works, right? And it's true, we require obedience from our children, don't get me wrong, but we must teach them that obedience is required, and it should flow from first trusting Christ for righteousness and looking to Him for power now to live by the Spirit for His glory. Uh, I mentioned fathers, moms, let me encourage you guys. Uh, moms, theology is not a man sport, and I'm really encouraged by our congregation that our women understand that, but there are many places in which uh, theology is something that only men want to talk about and women don't want to talk about, but moms, uh, young ladies, you need theology. Your, chil uh, your children learn so much of how they are to relate to God from your ministry to them throughout the day. Make sure you're teaching them well. Make sure you're grounding them in the gospel. That brings us to the second application, and the, the last two are more brief. The second is this. We have a duty as a church to preserve the gospel. We have a duty to preserve the gospel. Paul said in verse 5 that he did not yield to the Judaizers for one hour so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for the Galatians. Uh, Paul tells Timothy uh, that the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth, right? The church has the job of guarding the gospel. We have been entrusted with the pearl of the gospel. Uh, we, we teach our own kids that the gospel is like the most sacred uh, treasure that you possess that must be guarded and kept. And what we do with the gospel is much bigger than just ourselves, but it has ripple effects on the work of the gospel in the world. Think about it. What happens when a Christian loses the gospel? Well, it means all of their family and their friends and their co-workers also lose access to the gospel. When a church loses the gospel, a community loses the gospel. When a church loses the gospel, nations lose the gospel because they lose faithful missionaries that would have been sent out to bring the gospel to them. Uh, when we lose the gospel, something else automatically takes its place, and that is what starts to get transported out of us. Guarding the gospel, brothers and sisters, is not just about a holy huddle. It's not about some prideful, holier-than-thou club, and I can dot the, my I's and cross my T's of my theology better than everyone else. It's about the glory of Christ and the spread of His truth. I can't help but think of the great benefit of creeds and confessions that are rather unpopular in our day, but creeds and confessions throughout the history of the church are what solidify our faith. They, they protect orthodoxy. They keep heresies at bay and outside, and they make the right hand of fellowship much easier to extend because they allow us to identify who has the gospel and who doesn't. It allows us, they allow us to form partnerships and fellowships for the furthering of the gospel. You know, it, it shouldn't be a comfort to churches uh, that just any message about Jesus is going forth. We want to see the true gospel proclaimed by faithful Christians, by qualified pastors, church planners, and that can only happen if we do 
our part in preserving it. Lastly, as we close, and we'll be done here in three minutes, I want to give an application to the unbeliever. The unbeliever in our midst, you're not trusting Christ, you don't believe the gospel. I want to stress to you that all these things that I've mentioned this morning, in particular the last two applications, all of these things are vital so that we can do what we are doing today, proclaiming the gospel to you, so that we can offer you, my dear unbelieving friend, the true gospel. Think about it. If, if God had not preserved this church and permitted us by His grace to guard the gospel, if we had not cared about truth and about the eternal souls of those who are in our midst, you might have left here today hearing a pep talk, hearing a motivational speech, but instead you will leave ringing in your ears the truth of Christ and Him crucified. You will leave with a message ringing in your ears of an all-sufficient Savior, God the Son, coming to the sinful world in the flesh, to come into this world as a human like us, to live perfectly in obedience to His Father, obtaining the blessing and the reward of eternal life, and laying down His precious, sinless life, and to bear in His own body the wrath of God for all of His people. People who are unable in ourselves to do anything or to contribute anything for our own salvation. You get to hear the message that this Christ, this Savior, commands you simply to believe in Him for righteousness. You know, according to the Apostle Paul, telling, simply telling sinners to be good people and simply telling them to leave here and do better is actually slavery to the one who is dead in sin. Corpses, spiritually dead people, do not merely need to be told to live. They need to be given life. And that life comes through believing in Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit giving life to your spiritually dead heart to believe the gospel, to believe that I can do nothing, I can contribute nothing to make myself right with God, but Christ, one who is outside of me, has undertaken for me to do everything that I should have done, that I owe to God. He has done it, and He has undertaken for me that by trusting Him, He will present me holy and blameless before God. Christ calls you to believe the gospel. That means He calls you to rest in His finished work, to place your confidence in Him, to place your, your trust in Him that He is a sufficient Savior, and He can and will present all who trust in Him, all who come to Him before the Father, pure and blameless. He calls you to humble yourself, to let go of your grasp of anything you think you might have to offer and to cling to the righteousness of Christ. There is no greater message in all of earth. There's no greater liberty. Trust Christ today. Find peace from your burdened soul and rest from your labor. Come to Christ in the gospel. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you would write your word upon our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would be merciful to the unconverted. Lord, even as we sing in that great hymn, Lord, we pray that you would pity the nations, O oh, our God. You would constrain the earth to come. Lord, that you would draw many to yourself to see the beauties of Christ, their need of pardon and mercy and forgiveness. Father, be with your church. Help us. Lord, we live in a world that does not care much about truth. We live in a world that sees truth as divisive. Father, help us to be those who with courage gladly bear the reproach of being those who are faithful to your word. Lord, though we stand in the presence of a thousand enemies, grant us to remember that with you on our side, we are in the majority. Lord, there will be so many temptations that will come to us in our lifetimes, tempting us to abandon the truth, tempting us to compromise, tempting us to be inclusive with things that you tell us in your word cannot be considered part of the gospel. We pray, Lord, you would give us grace to stand in that day 
Lord, generations in the past have had to fight their battles. We pray that you would give us strength to fight ours, that we would be loving and winsome, and that we would be bold and courageous. Lord, we pray you'd help us to work through these things in our hearts, to count the cost that truly there may be coming a day in our generation in which allegiance to your word truly will mean severe hardship for Christians. Lord, may we not be fearful, but may we lean into you for your grace and your help. Help us not to shrink back, but to lean into trials, knowing that you are the God who brings life out of death. You are the God who saves sinners through persecution. We pray, Lord, you would give grace to your people. Bless our Lord's Day. Lord, may it be a day full of fellowship, of profitable discussion about your word. Lord, help us, we pray. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand.